let me start off the whole uh, discussions over here today. I formally let me welcome all of you again. Uh, very good morning to everyone. And uh, let me first give a little bit of brief introduction about our speaker today, uh, Mr. Venkatesh Hegde. Uh, Mr. Venkatesh Hegde uh, is a very, very senior gentleman with more than um, uh, four decades of uh, banking experience. Uh, truly, uh, you know, I would say, uh, you know, a banker who has worked in uh, multiple locations in India and abroad. And the last, uh, uh, you know, assignment was with State Bank of India as the general manager, uh, real estate and housing. And post that today, now he is also uh, the advisor for Saraswat Bank. So Mr. Vinkitesh Hede, uh, uh, you know, is going to take us through on the retail risk management, uh, practice in the banking sector and the emerging future. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about retail banking, I would like to take you to the entire retail banking and the expanding canvas we are in. Earlier, uh, when we were in our banks when we had, uh, I joined the bank way back in 1990, housing loan, personal loans and uh, auto loans were not a done thing. People used to wait till the age of 40, 43 to get into a housing finance kind of, uh, get a housing finance. People used to save and people used to get house after they saved for 40 years. But now things have changed and retail banking has expanded and has become the mainstay banking in most of the banks as well as NBFCs. Today, we are competing with almost 9,686 NBFCs, about 100 plus uh, HFCs. And we still have about 6,000 fintechs, which are competing this, uh, in this area. So what is retail banking exactly? When we talk about retail banking, it's accepting deposits and uh, making loans or giving out loans to the consumers. So what is the difference between a retail banking and a uh, wholesale banking. When we talk about retail banking, the loans are of a big size or a smaller size and the risk is diversified over a, long, uh, over a bigger population. Whereas in case of a corporate banking, the loans given are bigger in size, they are expense, uh, 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 very expensive and they take up a big chunk of a banks or a NBFC's mus a financial muscle. So if there is a default, in case of a retail bank, the default may not really shake the financial fabric of a particular bank or a NBFC. But while in case of corporate banking, there can be a turmoil. You have heard about uh, companies like Bhushan Steel. You have heard about companies like Alok Industries, which have failed in corporate banking and which have led to a real financial crisis for banks. But in case of retail banking, the story is different because we find that retail is spread over different segments and different uh, strata of the population. So they are smaller in size and banks can easily anticipate what can go wrong and they can mitigate the risk. So now when we talk about risk, what is a risk? Most of us many a times talk about risk, but what exactly is risk? When we talk about risk, it is variability of an outcome, a particular event happening or not happening. Or you can say a possibility of a loss or a possibility of diminution in value of an asset. So there are events which if they happen, they can cause problem for the bank. Like if a borrower defaults in payment of his dues, then it is called a credit risk. And then there are issues like in corporate finance where when the uh, day of uh, commercial production gets delayed, then the cash flow earnings of the person also get delayed. Similarly, if the company doesn't break even on time, there are issues of default. So there are events which can create default and there are events if they don't happen, they can create defaults. So the definition of risk, as I already told, is variability in the outcomes. What are the different types of risk we are talking about? When we talk about risk, the major risk we are going to look at is credit risk. The risk of a borrower defaulting in his payment. This is a very, very important risk which we would be talking in the coming slides. And there would be the next risk and that is the operational risk. Retail banking requires funding to lot many people in small size. So there are more possibilities of flaw in the operational system, in the way we fund uh, customers, in the way the uh, accounts are monitored and supervised. 
and today operational risk has become equally important like credit risk coming to asset valuation risk what is asset valuation risk asset valuation risk is a risk of a bank coming to a proper and accurate value of the asset it may be accurate valuation of an asset accurate valuation of a liability or accurate valuation of a collateral if you are unable to accurately value there is a risk of security cover and if there is a default in this particular loan we may lose out on the value of the security so properly valuing the risk is uh, valuing the asset is equally important coming to business risk business risk every bank every nbfc has a particular business strategy the the strategy may be a success or the strategy may be a failure so if a strategy works then the bank makes profit out of that product like in one of the banks in a big bank we had started a product called rllr loan that is repo linked housing loan but when we found that repo linked housing loan was not taking care of the exact interest expense we have on deposits and the other operative expenses we had to close down that particular product because that product was not giving enough profit to the bank so the strategy business strategy failure is one of the risk then coming to interest rate risk as all of you know many of you might be in banking and you know that banking is asset liability management we commit a particular interest rate to a depositor and against that we make a loan to a customer for his requirement at a particular rate these two interest rates on the two sides of the balance sheet do not match so there is always a gap and that gap is the spread on which the bank earns so over a period of time the deposit rates get fixed whereas the interest rates on advances may come down like it has been happening uh, in the past during the covid times so this interest risk may lead to losses for the bank and finally we come to the op- reputational risk bank or an nbfc gives commitment to his customer or to the regulator any failure on coming up on the commitment or the promises which we have given to the regulator can be a reputational risk the regulator may slap a penalty or may stop the working of a particular um, cooperative bank or an nbfc or a bank for the things which we have not come up to when we are promised or committed so reputational risk is a very big risk which we need to very efficiently uh, manage and mitigate when we talk about risk how do we manage risk there are four things to risk management one is identifying the risk second is measuring the risk then monitoring and then mitigating these are the four steps which are involved in risk management uh, the next slide please so coming to the most important risks in present day retail loan banks is operational risk and credit risks you might have heard that there is a dark side to every bright side so the dark side of retail banking is attending to this credit risk and the operational risk so how do we mitigate credit risk the risk of default of debt basically this is done through proper appraisal and proper selection if our selection is improper and if the customer is unable to pay the debt on time it may lead to risk of default so how do we assess properly so there are many parameters on the basis of which a bank assesses a, uh, assesses the customer's eligibility for a loan and his capacity to repay over a period of time some of the parameters which we generally look into are years in previous job a person who is hopping from one job to another may be a high risk for a bank because his earning capacity is always at risk and uncertain so his repayment capacity linked to his earning capacity can also be in a problem when we talk about age age is an important factor to credit decisioning and how does age affect credit decisioning the younger a person is the higher is his capacity to take risk whereas, whereas when we grow older the risk taking capacity may come down similarly the salary in the initial ages is lesser while the salary in the am i audible am i audible uh, yes, you are audible sir you are audible sir 
And yes, uh, uh, am I am I going on the right track? You yeah. can keep coming with. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Great, sir. So, yeah. When we talk about age, the most most productive age for any customer or for a bank to pick up customers is from thirty to fifty years of age, because the salary, because the salary or income earning capacity during this age is more than the later part of the. Uh, years from 50 to 65 as uh, you know then the number of years in residence having a proper address and being able to identify a customer's residence is equally important while we loan this is a important part of kyc so when we talk about kyc knowing the residence and the place one where works is important so this is one of the parameters when we uh, assess a home loan or an auto loan or a housing loan. Coming to the next parameter is the annual income. Annual income is the biggest parameter which decides what kind of capacity the borrower has. Suppose we are loaning him, his uh, salary is X. The maximum loan we can give him is let's say six or seven times of X if it is a personal loan. If it is a housing loan, we can expand the spectrum of uh, uh, loan amount. And if it is a gold loan, then it is a different thing altogether because we are looking at the interest payment to be given on time. Then we come to the number of dependents. If a person has more than four to five dependents, his sustenance cost or his livelihood cost goes up. So we have different ratios which we calculate what is left after the regular expenses which a customer can use for his uh, repayment schedule. So these are the things which are appraised during the credit risk so that the risk on default, risk of default is minimized. Coming to the risk on account of technology operations and KYC. As I was telling you, operational risk is a risk which emanates from frauds that may be committed by the customer or those that might be perpetrated by the employees or fake documents which might be produced while we are doing the KYC of the customer. Similarly, there might be issues in the title. There are umpteen number of operational issues which we need to encounter and uh, mitigate to get this operational risk properly handled. CR mitigation through risk scoring model. What does a bank do? Banks generally depend on an internal credit rating model where about 15 to 20 and at times maybe even 50 to 60 parameters are checked and analyzed before customer is found fit to be financed. When we talk about 15, I would like to give you, these are the five which I have already spoken about. They will also look at the credits in your account, the debits in your account, the civil score, the uh, if there is an additional earning member in the family, so about 15, 16 parameters are ranked in a scale of one to 10 and the ranks are given and an internal credit scoring model is devised so that when a decision on credit is taken, we take a very, very calculated and prudent decision so that the bank doesn't lose. So there are scores which above 60 mean clear sanction while below 60, they may mean that we need to do credit enhancement or we need to do further investigation into the KYC and see whether the income generation can be propped up by adding a daughter's salary or a wife's salary and how we can ensure that more salary streams or more income streams are brought together to see that the repayment in future is properly ensured. Now, KYC validation and technology enhancements. When we started way back in housing in banks, in 1998, State Bank had a SBI Home Finance Limited, which was looking after housing. But later on, what happened was slowly banks started giving home loans. And KYC validation, a very core banking, uh, uh, what you call, core banking activity was done in-house. But over the period, the technology and fintechs have grown so much and the core banking solution has come in. So KYC validations many a time is done by fintechs which give you support. There is Perfios, there is an organization called Perfios which does credit analysis for you, 
or the account statement analysis. Perfios takes consent from the customer, pulls out the account statements of from different banks and analyzes how this account means credit spends are there, credits in the accounts come in and the debits happen. So Perfios is one of the things. Then there is a Karza.com. Karza.com ensures that the employment check is properly done. Most of the time, I have seen there is a very, very recent case which I have come across. I was talking to one of my friend in an NBFC. He was saying an organization in Nagpur started in a regular fashion by taking a license for cultural activity. They employed five to six people and started giving them salary. Based on the salary and the commitment of this organization, few NBFCs funded this organization and later on, it was seen that this organization started collecting money for employing people. And over a period of time, they closed shop, running away with the amount that they had collected. But during this interagnum, a lot of NBFCs and banks had given uh, home loans and personal loans to the employees of this organization. And they came to grief because proper assessment of this particular organization was not done. Here, Karza.com helps you in knowing how long this organization has been in existence, whether the email address, official email address given by them, uh, your customer is correct. So all such things, KYC validations are done. Similarly, NSDL will help you in checking the Aadhaar. Then we have an IT pan ver uh, verification software. So the technology enhancements and the uh, FinTech supports, which we are getting over a period of time, uh, helped us in KYC validation, which is very, very important. If you have heard recently, government told that we shouldn't be sharing the Aadhaar uh, number with everyone because there are possibilities of this being fabricated and wrong people or misselection of customers. So masking of Aadhaar and ensuring the data is properly protected is also an important part. So these are the things which I'm just giving you a uh, what you call peep into what kind of credit risks we face in a retail loan. Next slide, please. Coming to score-based evaluation and behavioral analysis. When a credit proposal is received by an NBFC, these days there is a huge competition, a really fierce competition between giving a loan or not giving a loan because one customer, about four to five uh, bankers, non bankers NBFCs are running after him to give personal loan. Daily, I get about two, three calls from NBFCs for personal loans, pre-approved personal loans of five lakhs, two lakhs. So in this competitive world, we need to know which customer we need to finance, which is our niche segment. So banks have a niche segment, which is salaried, and uh, professionals like doctors, while NBFCs look at the unorganized sector. So while doing that, we need to, having said you know, the various niche segments of each um, organization, I would like to know how, I would like to tell you how score-based analysis is done, behavioral analysis is done. The three decisions which are required in a retail loan are to be done in a very, very fast manner. Turnaround time for loan is the most important element for improving your retail business. Many a times we find that people take one month to two months, but by then there are other competitors who take away this loan because their credit decisioning, the decisioning process is fast. So go decision is a clear decision of sanction. No go decision is where sanctions are given with deviations. Let me sound a word of caution here because I have seen NBFCs going after customers in such aggressive manner that many a times there is a go by given to KYC norms. We take KYC very lightly and uh, misselection happens. There are also cases called OTCs. In NBFCs, I have found the OTCs. Over-the-counter sanctions means half papers are ready but the rest of the papers are in the process. But just to ensure that the business go, doesn't go past us, we give them sanction. Similarly, there is something called PDs. PDs is post-disbursement uh, post completion of certain 
formalities. This also is fraught with risk because once the customer gets the disbursement, he may not comply with your requirement and things may lead to a default which we need to uh, guard against. Let me tell you your two, three pitfalls which we have observed in uh, when I was working in uh, my earlier bank and now in a cooperative bank. There is a default of a builder not completing the project. So we need to know whether this builder, uh, need, uh, what number of proposals we should do in a particular builder's project. So this is called builder concentration. So if we don't look at builder concentration, what will happen? We'll be financing about 15 to 20 uh, pro, uh, flats in a particular building just because the connection with our connection with the builder is good. And later on, the building may not be completed in the reasonable given time. And this can lead to risk. Similarly, we have gone through lot many cases where COVID happened and many companies folded office. We had jet airways cases. No? Am I audible? You're absolutely audible, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So what I was saying, pandemic has been a great opportunity for, for, uh, for us to learn. There has been a paradigm shift in the way banking is done. Many things were done online and lot many things like going and visiting the person's house or going and visiting his offices couldn't be done because his offices were closed. And we found that the, uh, many companies stopped working because they didn't have enough funds to go through the rough patch of the pandemic. So lot many accounts went bad. These are the economic conditions which cause disruption in the loaning and defaults rise because of this. So proper assessment of the company in, uh, in for whom the borrower is working is also very, very important. So doing a sanction with deviation is fraught with risk. Business, okay, I understand lot many DSAs are under tremendous pressure to perform and give a certain amount of business, but that doesn't mean we should throw caution to the wind. KYC needs to be done in its true spirit, as well as we need to assess the employer and we need to assess the asset which is being purchased, whether the builder is reputed, whether the building would come up or whether he has any stalled projects. Such things are very, very important. So the go, no go and rejection decisions should be taken very, very uh, prudently. Many times we find these days that there are credit decisioning tools which give you, the, which spit out uh, credit decisions. But these are fraught with risk because nobody can substitute human intelligence. So in personal loans, there might be a total digitalization or end-to-end -end digitalization. But in housing loan, similarly in case of auto loans, we need to do some kind of a manual intervention because we need to go and check the house where the customer stays or the office. We have to visit the property. All these things are important because our vendors or our depend uh, we have dependabilities like we have to depend on valuation, we have to depend on title search. They may do a good work and they may not do a good work. So as a abundant precaution, we need to take a second check on the valuation of the property. I have seen valuers just driving past the property and valuing the property at an X rate. But if we don't properly take care of the valuation by a second check, maybe this would be an inflated value. So these days we are giving a instruction to our uh, valuers that they should put a photo in the valuation report so that no, we know that he has actually visited and seen each and every room in a housing uh, case. Or if, if we are financing a machinery, we tell him to uh, see, uh, take a photograph of the machinery with the date in the camera. Similarly, we ask him to jot down the last uh, sale done in that area and what was the comparable rate. What is the rate in the 99 acres or a magic break? and compare it with the revenue rate or the government mandated rate. All these things are done so that we avoid the asset valuation risk. Now there are, there are behavioral patterns. These are the things which banks do. Banks have structured data points. What is the difference between a bank and an NBFC? Banks work on structured data points, whereas NBFCs work on unstructured data points. 
because if NBFCs work on uh, structured data points, they may not be able to catch the clientele which they are right now focusing on. They are the unorganized sectors. They are the small traders. They are uh, uh, the professionals and uh, the other people who don't get funding that easily from the bank because banks generally focus on salaried and a certain portion of uh, professionals. So behavioral patterns come into play. What, what do I mean by behavioral patterns? What generally happens is NBFCs do a, analytics on analytics on uh, let's say how many cylinders does a customer take in a year? How many cylinders do a customer does a customer take in a year? Because that gives the kind of spend he has for his regular uh, livelihood. Similarly, they look at the online purchases he makes on Amazon, the Mintra, and other places. The telephone bills are checked. Then there is something called a check on uh, the maintenance bill of the house. These, all these things, the banks are not in a position to check because every check requires the customer's consent. So there is a concept called customer consent management, which these fintechs these days try to get and try to access every possible uh, data, which is giving the behavioral pattern of the customer. They'll go into the social media. They see what kind of spend he has on transport and what is the repayment history of his earlier personal loans. And all these things lead to a proper assessment of a stated income. What do I mean by stated income? Many a times uh, we have to go by stated income because these clients don't have IT returns. They don't have a uh, account which is properly maintained. So they give their income basis, the uh, daily revenues they earn. So this stated income has to be cross-checked by a person who goes there at the shop or the place and tries to find out how many people visit the property, uh, visit the shop, how many say, uh, like in a case of a doctor, a person goes to his dispensary and sees how many patients visit daily, what is the general fee the doctor charges, and what is the lean period and what is the peak period. So such kind of analysis is done. This brings me to a, uh, to a finance, uh, financial crisis that happened in US in 2008, 2009, and 2010, because fortunately due to State Bank of India I had the opportunity to work in US. And I saw what happens when we go overboard in retail banking. When we talk about retail banking, there were, those were the days when retail banking was done by in US, they said bad credit, bad civil, no problems. You have issues in your payment, no problems. So KYC as well as income generation check was given a go by and crisis happened. Bank of America was on the crisis. In crisis, they were about to fail. They, we had failure of Merrill Lynch. So many organizations failed and the financial stability of banks, credit unions, as they are called for NBFCs, are called credit unions in uh, America. All of them were closing shop because many of them were closing shop. And the big, um, uh, big four had a real problem because retail loans were done without proper check of the um, proper check of the customer. So U.S. administration came out with a with a uh, with with. Dodd Frank Act in 2010. What was this act? This was talking about the financial stability of the banking system in general. How KYC should be done. What there it is called FICO checks or FICO check, we, which we here call credit bureau check. How FOIA should be checked. They call their DTL or debt to uh, uh, debt to loan uh, ratio or income to loan ratio. So all these things were to be checked and people were problems, banks as well as the credit unions were brought under strict vigil. Reserve requirements were increased. They were not allowed to lend without proper check on. There were payday loans as they were called. 
a similar thing happened when we were in around 2013-14, where a lot of uh, defaults started happening. We had the ILFS failure, which brought us to a situation where we had to do a lot of analysis of uh, the customer when we lend. So what are the things which we need to check? The credit bureau check. You know it, that there are four credit bureaus in India. One is Sibyl, the second one is CRIF, IMARC, Experian, and we have one more Experian. Four are there. So generally, people go by Sibyl. Huh? Uh, Equifax. Yeah, yeah, Experian, uh, which is the one you said, sorry? Equifax. Equifax. Equifax, Equifax Experian, uh, CRIF, IMARC, and uh, Sibyl. So what happens is these credit bureaus also get, uh, work on, credit bureaus were started in 2010, let me tell you, earlier credit bureaus were not in operation in India because we never knew that credit history has to be checked because retail loans were in very nascent stage in 2000, early 2000. I still remember having read a book by uh, Divana Joseph who said that retail banking is as hot as as hot as a, a curry, a govan curry, which is very spicy, or it is called, uh, why did he say that? Because retail bank has multiferous things to be checked. There are multiple products, there are multiple channels, and there are multiple customers. When we talk about multiple uh, channels, we talk about, uh, we talk about uh, uh, banker, uh, business, uh, mm, Correspondence, we talk about uh, uh, call centers, we talk about online uh, credit uh, apps. We, so there are so many products as well as so many things which need to be checked. So in 2010, they thought that credit assessment for retail was not easy because there was not enough data to assess credit. So credit bureaus were started. Initially, civil check was only done and the second check was not done. but data supply to these credit uh, bureaus has its own issues. So certain banks started checking two credit bureau scores. So some banks do Sybil as well as Griff, my I mark. some banks do Sybil as well as Experian, some do Sybil and uh, the other ones. So this is, there is a particular score against which there is a clear sanction. 680 and above, it is a clear sanction, whereas Below 650, you need to do further analysis. Now, what is FOIA? Fixed obligation to income ratio. We have to ensure that a customer is not highly leveraged. She doesn't go out into the market and take a personal loan, take an auto loan, take a home loan, and over a period of time, he starts defaulting. So we have to ensure that the FOIA is good enough to keep him enough money for his sustenance and later on leave sufficient surplus for paying the uh, dues. Let me tell you one case of, case of mine where the nurse, the male nurse who was tending to my father-in-law had taken loans for different online apps and had really got into a very tight corner. He found that loans were coming very easy. So he took loans from online apps, he took loans on credit cards, he took loans for his uh, automobile. So all these things were done because he was in an unorganized sector where his uh, income couldn't be properly judged. So this is here, the fire is one important thing which we need to check. The, it, uh, as I said, it is called DTL in some places. So anything above 40% or above 43% in US is a danger level because a person cannot survive with 50% of salary because there are expenses to be taken care of. Then we come to loan to value. This is an RBI regulated ratio. Loan to value means when a property is being financed, we should ensure that the loan that we give against property doesn't cross a certain percentage. There are social objectives where affordable housing, we give loan up to 90% of the asset value. Whereas in higher loan cases, the loan to value is has a ceiling of 75%. Why is this done? Why is this done? This is done because 
in cases like crisis which happened subprime crisis the property value started dropping and the margin the customers margin of 20 25% was wiped out and only the bank borrowing was left so customers started leaving the house tearing apart the house in, at times because wooden houses are there and leaving the house which wouldn't fetch enough value even to liquidate the loan so loan to value is very very important we should ensure that even if there is a fall in the value like it happened during the pandemic time an unprecedented time it was property values in bombay dropped to the extent of 15 to 20% and some places like uh, chennai they were down by almost 20% so if there is a fall in the property values it's called the distress price we should get we should be properly covered coming to internal cutoff source internal i have talk, talked about this that there are 15 different par parameters on which a customer is judged here we take a prudent call that 60 will be a clear sanction 80 um, 50 will require some kind of deviation and below 50 we will not sanction but when a pandemic like kind of thing happens what do we do this internal cutoff scores are jacked up instead of 60 we make it 70 and the deviation part will be brought down to, let's say 50 so by doing this we try to mitigate the risk to a certain extent then there are payment types when we talk about payment types there are floating rate loans and there are fixed rate loans there were there was a time when the rates were dropping that was during the uh, covid times so we came down to 6.45% in uh, housing loans whereas the fixed rates were somewhere around 8 so people thought that they should be on the floaters whereas uh, fixed rate if they had taken today they would have been in a better position because fixed rates go for next 5 years or the reset is for 3 years but floating rates will create issues of repayment because the emis will go up in banks sometimes we extend the period period of loan but at times nbfcs keep uh, increase the emis and the customer may not be in a position to take care of the increased emi because the salaries are not going up on the other way uh, they may be coming down because there are salary cuts which have happened uh, in some organizations which are trying to make good the losses which they incurred during the pandemic period so these are few of the parameters which i feel and even in india rbi came out with such regulations like the reason for telling you dot frank act was rbi also came out with financial stability report for banks it also came out with depositors uh, code of uh, conduct or bankers code of conduct for depositors lenders code all these things tells what a bank should do and what a bank shouldn't do so in our anxiety to do business if we are uh, trying to give a go by to certain credit mitigants maybe over a period of time we may end up into a wrong selection let me tell you one thing there were some builders who are laughing uh, an example which we have i have personally gone through there were some builders who were uh, over trading rather they had started two three buildings at a time and for ensuring that they take the money out of the system they had uh, fake uh, customers taking home loans his own driver his uh, accountant uh, his uh, employee and a lot of housing loans were given in that property and that amount used to go to the builder and the builder was trying to complete his product out of the housing loan given to his own employees and in the process he was also trying to repay the installments repay the installments regularly for 14 13 14 months this is what some unscrupulous people do so the real test of a loan comes when 12 13 months of proper repayment has happened and you go and see whether the property is in place the regular inspection or supervision and follow up which we talk about if we do that you will find that these were all fabricated loans so all the checks are very much required and the rules which have come on rbi's rule on ltv rbi's rule on provisioning are very important next slide please hope i am uh, to the i am sticking to the time mr kalyan raman you are on time sir it's absolutely we have time 15 minutes we have sir yeah yeah now talking about the risk based pricing in our anxiety to do business because as i told you there are almost 9,686 nbfcs vying for 
the same pie of business in this uh, organize. I mean, in the economy, and many people run after the same customer. So the customer will always be. We have come from the suppliers market to the buyers market. I remember in the early late nineties, getting a home loan was very very difficult. And there were no personal loans at all. They were called consumer durable loans, where fridge, refrigerator, and such things were financed directly to the vendors. But that was fraught with risk, so they came out with personal loans. And today, personal loans are given left, right, center without proper check and uh, checks and balances. So to ensure that misselection losses are properly compensated, we have risk based pricing. because one price is sold is not true in retail banking why not true in retail banking it's not true in the present competitive world at all so different customers are charged different then how do we charge how do we assess the risk now when we talk about risk we go by the loan term initially personal loans were given only for 3 years which went on for 5 years and then for 7 years and now sometimes some organizations are even ready to give a rolling loan they keep it rolling on from 3 to 5 and uh, such things so loan term if you are taking a long term risk on a particular customer then the rate of interest needs to be jacked up so that the risk premium is taken care of then we talk about loan amount affordable loans are given basis the salary of the person you might have heard about pma rry means prime minister's uh, avas yojana where uh, the uh, national mandate was that we should finance there should be home for all so we were financing loans up to 30 lakhs at a, a discounted rate and government was subsidizing us but when we go to amounts which are 75 lakhs and above the rates have to be higher or they need to be calibrated with the civil score uh, why do the rates be higher because when we talk about unorganized sector or the self employed and professionals the general risk is in times of pandemic unprecedented times like uh, pandemic what happens is the customer would like that his business survives and his livelihood survives rather than uh, paying his home loans so in such cases when we give loans to businessmen and uh, traders who are in big business there would be defaults unless we have properly checked his past credit history and his civil score so loan amounts above 75 lakhs slightly carry a higher risk then talking about civil score earlier civil score was one of the parameters in the internal credit scoring it wasn't a parameter for risk based pricing what is now let me go a, a little deeper and tell you what a risk based scoring is rbi has told us that whenever there is a decrease in interest we need to pass or that there has to be transmission of this interest concession to the customers so that the economy grows and when there is a increase in rate the uh, interest rates are also increase this has been the trend so rbi is talking about linking this rate to an external benchmark rate like might be a repo rate it might be a bill of exchange rate or any rate so how is this risk based pricing done we take the repo rate at which rbi lends us and we add risk premium and when we talk about risk premium all the six parameters come into play then we add our operational cost then we add credit cost what is a credit cost credit cost is a cost of loan going bad suppose we are going to lose or about let's say 100 crores then the credit cost of losing 100 crores is factored by way of credit cost so we have all these things which together lead to risk based pricing so i have talked about loan term i have talked about loan amount and um, civil score type of customer when we are talking about type of customer customer in higher age bracket needs to be properly assessed because his earning capacity would go down whereas in case of a youngster the earning capacity may go up so we have loans called step up loans where a customer is given loan one and a half times his eligibility by factoring his future earnings this is what happens in case of techies so the initial installments are less emis are less to match his 
present salary and the installment keeps on ballooning as the salary grows. While in case of a pensioner, we, we know rather a person is going to retire in the next 10 years, what uh, they do is the initial installments are high and when he retires and he gets on a fixed kind of income, the installments keep going down. So we try to assess the type of our customer. And while taking assessment also, there is an unwritten law that we generally uh, try to avoid a politician, um, a, what do you call legal uh, professional, because they are prone to get into complications. So there is an unwritten law that we, and then there are areas, there is a gender, like uh, we talk about women empowerment. So most of the banks and some NBFCs give an additional concession for women. They get a five bits reduction in the rate which is applied to male. So that uh, it's, it's a known fact and uh, self-help groups have proven it that when a lady takes a loan, the repayment, generally the repayment capacity, uh, the repayment history is better. Now we come to type of security. What is the type of security we need to um, check on? The type of security is very, very important because I have seen multiple lendings being done on the same security or a security which is under construction and we have not uh, assessed properly. Or in case of auto loans, I've seen that we have, uh, there were some finance, big ticket financing done for Ferraris and Mercedes and the vendor didn't deliver the cars and loans of two and three crores went bad because there was a nexus. Uh, there was an excellence between um, the vendor and the borrower and the margin money was given by the car dealer and the amount was taken by the car dealer, the loan amount was taken by the car dealer. So the type of security we have to check whether so many um, high-end high cars are being sold, whether uh, the house is under construction. So these are the things which are factored in a risk-based pricing and a different customer is given a different uh, rate. Now we talk about customer relationship management, which is the in thing in today's uh, banking. We look at our customer and his uh, vintage. So if a customer has already taken two auto loans and repaid it and has taken a housing loan too, the third auto loan which he takes comes at a, a discount. So that we know his repayment capacity is good. He's, uh, he has a good track record and we, he may not default. So Customer relationship management checks the life cycle of a customer, what are his needs and how we can finance, what is the best product we can give him. And each and every bank and NBFCs are today very effectively using this customer relationship management. And I, I would suggest that please check what are the previous customs or previous relations of this customer and how he has uh, taken care of this relation. And we can progressively give more loans to people who have proven themselves in that we are repayment track record and we can avoid misselection if we have seen that uh, he has defaulted in the past. Now coming to marketing initiatives. Today we are in an age of marketing initiatives. Each NBFC, each bank is on a marketing blitzkrieg. There are uh, SMS, bulk SMS is being sent. There are uh, uh, what you call advertisement plus. There are email plus. So we are almost using all data. Data is the gold in the present uh, uh, economy. So basis the data we get from browsing, we start sending out uh, emails, SMSs, WhatsApp, and uh, you, say, uh, you say and you do it uh, kind of things. And a lot of customers come to us. There are, in such cases, what happens is there are people who are professionals in taking loans. So we need to know whom to take and whom not to take. Marketing initiatives are good. But through marketing initiatives, whatever comes needs to be properly analyzed. Uh, and the spend on marketing should be for proper selection of the customer rather than uh, going after a person who is after you. Coming to the screening applicants. When the applications are received, there is a lot of screening which is, need, uh, which is done either through a software or fintech or through managing the accounts. We need to manage the accounts properly because as I have told, when you give a new housing loan, we look at the old auto loan that the customer has taken and if has been paying properly, we see the, an opportunity there to give him a top-up loan. The housing loan, whatever equity is left out of it, maybe after two, three years, we give him a top-up loan and 
uh, take advantage of our relation with the customer. Whereas if we see an account going into stress, we need to ensure that there is a balance transfer before the account goes into uh, a problem. So we need to do proper quality assessment once we are screened, sanctioned. Our work doesn't stop there. The supervision and follow-up continues in monitoring the, and this is a very, very important and cumbersome task. Next slide, please. Now, retail risk management. Interest rate risk, I have already spoken. Asset liability management. We have to ensure that the fixed deposits, the rates which are fixed, but loan rates keep on coming up and down. So the asset liability management should properly be uh, managed and we don't lose out uh, by paying more to the depositors and taking less from the customers. So this is the interest rate risk and regulatory compliances which uh, surround this particular risk. There are external factors like the social environment as I was talking. Suddenly a virus totally disrupts the economy like we had in COVID and defaults are on the rise not because they are intentional but because of the problems in the uh, area. Then there are economic impacts. Certain uh, things happen in a particular city or a particular locality and businesses are closed and we need to take care of such issues. So interest risk, risk is very, very important. Credit risk and interest benchmarking, I have already spoken about how repo rate is linked and how credit risk premium is added to it with this component. Now we come to what are the regulatory compliances. With the experience we had from ILFS, with the experience we had from the American subprime crisis, RBI has kept certain conditions while we do retail loaning because uh, they want banks and NBFCs not to go overboard. So there is a capital requirement now. When we do a housing loan, we, and we have to provide only 35% if it is below, let's say, no, 75 lakhs, but when it goes above 75 lakhs, the capital requirement is 50%. In the process, the liquidity of the bank and the stability bank of the bank is ensured because there is a capital requirement which the RBI stipulates to ensure that the financial stability of banks and NBFCs is maintained. Coming to provisioning, there is one more requirement that is provisioning which has to be calculated. And as I told you, this is called the credit cost. So even a standard asset, all of you might be knowing what an NPA is. I wouldn't like to go in it. For NPA, even a standard asset cost carries 0.25% provisioning. From the profit, the banks have to keep aside 0.25%. But if there is a stress, an account becomes an SMA, special mention asset, zero up, default up to 30 days, default up to 60 days, and default beyond 60 days, then there is a provisioning of 50%, 15% required. Doubtful assets require 25% plus 40% of the unsecured portion or 100%. So this is a cost which is involved, which needs to be factored in the interest. Otherwise, there is an interest rate risk, which may lead to loss in a particular business. Retail lending has very wafer thin margin. It's not like wholesale banking where we charge 11%, uh, 10% rates and the margin or profit margin is margin spread available to the bank is very high. So there uh, we can to certain extent be a, a bit lenient, but in case of uh, loans in retail, we need to add this cost to LTV ceiling. I have already spoken. CRE norms. Now there are CRE norms which are applicable to property banks. Basically in banks, Commercial risk, risk loans is not capped. Your housing loan is outside CRE. Only builder loans come under CRE. The lap loan against property is also under CRE in banks as well as NBFCs. But in case of cooperative banks, we have to ensure that our CRE lending doesn't cross 10% of our total loan book. Maximum, they give us a, a leg room of another 5%. So maybe 10 plus 5, 15% can be given as CRE loans. So there are embargoes on lending to CRE. So while selecting, we have to ensure that we select properly and we don't leave out good customers. When rates are, uh, when there is an advertisement, generally bad customers also come. 
and when rate is jacked, uh, interest rate is jacked up, good customers may go away from us because there is competition in the market. So these CRE norms should be properly, uh, effectively used so that we ensure good customers are uh, brought on our books. Then there is product parameterization. There are a lot of things which we need to do in product parameterization. This is a topic in itself, maybe um, some other day on that. Uh, we are talking, when we talk about product parameterization, we have to ensure that when the amortization is done, the component of interest and loan uh, is such that it is repaid in the set term. So they have set a limit of 30 years. RBI said that home loans generally should be repaid within 30 years. And the general age of uh, lending should not cross 70 for banks. It is 60 for uh, NBFCs and maybe 65 in some case of private banks and urban banks, it is 60 years. Because if it is beyond 60, the chances of uh, income dwindling is very heavy and uh, default rates may go up. So these are all the regulatory compliances which we need to uh, ensure. And in case of NBFC, HFCs, if the HFC has to maintain its flavor as an HFC and not get into the NBFC category, they have to ensure that their home loan book is 50%. But these days, HFCs generally, the main flavor is personal loans because personal loans, the rate of interest is high and the earning and profitability is also very high. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Kalyan Raman, am I overshooting? Mr. Kalyan Raman? Uh, you have another 10 minutes to go, sir. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so, we have talked a lot on credit risk. Now, let me come to operational risk. And I think this slide may be very, very, very important for NBFCs and uh, banks because a uh, lot many cases, the NPA percentage, which used to be in big banks like SBI and others, and it's still be below point, uh, 0.3 or 0.5, certainly started going up during the COVID period. And RBI came out with uh, moratorium and there was restructuring and loans. So to avoid such things, we need to mitigate or uh, uh, take care of the operational risk at each stage of uh, loaning, like uh, taking care of sourcing, taking care of processing, closure and collateral loans, misselection due to KYC labs and frauds. We have seen lot many forged documents these days. So this is KYC is the most important thing. And particularly in case of NBFCs, I have a word of caution because uh, the FI or the investigation, the residence and office ver verification has to be very, very paka. Otherwise, the forged documents happen dime a dozen. And I have seen this happening and uh, you have seen online frauds happening because we are, many a times are lending online. So then there is, in misselection, there is one more, is multiple loans I have already spoken. Coming to impersonation. We do a very good KYC analysis. We do everything. And when the documentation part comes in, we don't do a second KYC. And somebody else comes and signs because we are in a hurry to disperse because we have to uh, achieve the month end targets. We have to show that we have performed. So though the KYC at the initial stage, stage was good, KYC at the time of disbursement or documentation takes a back seat. And uh, we find that at the time when there is default and we want to enforce the document, they turn out to be signed by the wrong person. Coming to caution profile, as I have already told, there is a caution. Caution profile is one more thing which we have to always check. And caution profile comes from our data analysis. Our data shows us that a particular segment, let's say, uh, vegetable vendors in a particular area have started defaulting because they have re-migrated to their hometown and giving them now would may lead to problems. Similarly, a particular business, tailoring business might be coming down. So there are caution profiles drawn up by each of the organizations which needs to be uh, checked properly and uh, those 
selections need to be avoided. Negative area. Certain areas are known for default because peer level pressures are there and the general culture in the area is uh, bad. So we have to have a, a pre uh, knowledge of such areas where we have to go with caution. Coming to title issues and insurance. These things can be taken care of taking an insurance, a property insurance or a credit insurance means the loan is insured or a life insurance of the borrower, which will to a certain extent mitigate the risk involved because if the loan goes bad, the credit insurance company will pay you. Similarly, if the title has is bad, then we that uh, security is not good for us in, at the time of liquidation. We may not get money out of it. So we, there are title insurance companies insuring title. There are people, I am GC, which insures uh, in default. Now there is a risk involved, operational risk involved in DSA and vendor integrity. DSAs keep moving from one company to another and uh, their survival is on a variable pay scale. And many a times BT is the root, balance transfer from one company to one bank to another. So, and there are operational risk, as I told, comes from customer fraud on account of customer and an employer. So here we need to guard ourselves. Then there are uh, dependabilities like a legal check and a valuation check. We have found that the selection of a value or a selection of a advocate is wrong. So blacklisting them is also very, very important because we have to see how many of the valuations have gone wrong from the accounts which have gone bad. Similarly, titles have been found to be defective. That again is a other thing, proper documentation, stamping is an issue, proper stamps are not taken, proper documentation are not done, and these can lead to operational risk. So these are a few things. Operational risk is a whole gamut of uh, issues which you need to take. And while if you do a proper follow-up, proper supervision and follow-up after the loan is given, maybe these issues can be taken care of. Coming to collection issues. Operational risk is also in collection because feet on street is very, very important in present retail uh, banking uh, scenario. If our collection mechanism is not good, even our, the best paymaster may not pay in case of a personal loan because we are financing an unorganized sector or a, a sector where if you go there, the number of visits, how often do you visit the customer? Do you really ensure his cash flows are captured? Do you see whether his business is on, whether the business has stopped, whether he has migrated? All these things come out in a collection. So in many a times it happens that in a structured uh, organization like bank, collection is outsourced and there is an issue that the collecting person also turn out to be a risk or collection is not happening at all. So such things also are important and NBFCs are very, very adept in this. And I'm sure NBFCs can help out banks in uh, improving the collection mechanism because their feet on street is very nice and uh, very good and their connect with the customers are also good. Improper closure of accounts is wrong closure of accounts because the risk of an internal internal uh, employee or a customer closing an account by putting in credits from different accounts or giving out a, a title a deed before the account is closed. Such issues are operational issues and every, whether it is processing, sourcing, every stage, this operational list needs to be taken care of. Next, please. Formal and informal segments. I don't know how many are. Uh, as I told, each segment has is, you know, is its own market. Banks rely more on salaried and a part of non-salaried. Whereas NBFCs are fine with customers in the unorganized sector because they have an absolutely good mechanism of understanding the system of unorganized sector. So they have a very good fit on state. And then I also talked about data points, structured and unstructured. So the unstructured data points with NBFCs have helped them in selecting the people from unorganized sector well their collection mechanism is good and the outsource model now banks are also an outsource model outsource model for sourcing as well as outsource model for collection so this can be a risk for banks at times because the uh, overview and supervision may not happen as it should so 
uh, NBFCs, this is the flavor. So maybe there is a difference between a bank and NBFC, as I already told you. They many of um, places NBFCs are not deposit taking, so they have to ensure whatever funding they get from banks are properly utilized, and they charge more so that the income they earn is more than what they pay to the banks. Whereas banks are mandated and have a social obligation to charge as uh, affordable as possible for the company, um, for the customer to take care of. So, and as such, financial bandwidth of a bank is more. So they, I, I, let me tell you, State Bank of India has a home loan book of almost five and a half trillion. That's a big, big number, but majority of it is from salaried and uh, unorganized sector also it is known businessmen. But uh, in case of unorganized sector, they are getting into types of fintechs, they are getting into types of NVFCs for uh, co-lending and co-origination, which I'll be talking about. So models of customer profiling is done better by NVFCs in case of organized, unorganized sector. And I think the next is the last slide of mine. Okay. Uh, do I have time or should I close? You have time, sir. Five minutes you have. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, because uh, we got into a bit of retail is a expanding horizon because wholesale banking is shrinking over the period of time because corporates have different uh, options like private equity. They can go to the market. They can uh, buy. Uh, they can self fund. They can raise uh, debentures. So there are a hundred ways for them to uh, get their requirement. So wholesale banking and the income coming out of wholesale banking is slowly coming down, whereas retail banking is here to stay. The percentage, which was around 4 to 5% of the total loan book in 98, 99, has almost gone to, let's say, around 46, 47% in many of the banks. And it is and NBFCs are almost working on that. And they, it may grow further. Let me tell you our penetration of retail loans or housing loans is much less, much less than many other Asian countries like Malaysia, Philippines, uh, because where the concentration is almost 55% to 35% to 55% where we are much less. So we have a huge scope to improve. And how will we be improving? The coming days will be end-to-end -end digitalization. More end-to-end -end experience will bring in more business. So, and this can be done in collaboration. Only collaborative efforts will give us business. So co-lending and co-origination would be an in thing. NBFCs, FinTechs can collaborate with the banks to do the co-origination. What does co-origination mean? The NBFCs will source the loans, do the initial part of sourcing. The second KYC will be done by the bank and a service fee will be given to the NBFC because NBFC doesn't have enough financial bandwidth. The second part is co-lending. And many banks, I think Bank of Baroda and State Bank are in co-lending in a big way. And what co-lending means is 20% of the loan, whether it is housing loan or a personal loan or an agri loan, is funded by the NBFC and 80% is passed on to the uh, bank. And how does the customer benefit? The rate of interest N NBFC generally used to charge in the past was anywhere between 16 to 24% where banks used to charge, are charging around 8 to 12%. So a blended rate brings down the cost for the customer. It may be around 14 to 15%. So that's win-win for all. The NBFC benefits, the bank benefits, and the customer benefits. So this co-lending and co-origination model would be an in thing in the coming days. Now we come to the second model, which is called BNPL. Buy now and pay later. Personal loans are getting replaced by BNPL. What is BNPL? We go to buy a prop, um, buy a refrigerator. There is a person in between, like say Amazon Pay, who will say that we will pay the vendor or we will pay the supplier and you pay us over a period of six months or you pay us over a period of uh, one year. So there, here the rate of interest is two, three percent. So what does the lender earn? So the lender gets eight to nine percent maybe from the manufacturer because he can push sales, whereas the customer may be charged two percent or no interest loans, and it's again a good thing. 
coming to RB, RPA or robotic process automation or uh, Lean Six Sigma, what is it? Many of the activities in retail loans is very cumbersome, repetitive, and may lead to operational flaws and may lead to defaults or, or may lead to losses. So robotic process automation is a Six Sigma where the error of such, such errors are brought down to almost zero point, uh, that means the accuracy is 99.99999 because all repetitive things are passed on to the robotics and uh, the bank only does the uh, decisioning. Neo banks, as I have already told, is something which is coming heavily. We have uh, in, uh, in BNPL, we have the names like uh, Easy Pay or Lazy Money, Simple Money. There are hundreds of people who are in this business now. Now, coming to neo banks, these banks are totally online banks. They don't have physical presence. They are only on online and they use the facilities of the bank and their licenses, NBFC license and they do give the digital experience to the customer and earn out of this servicing. Open banking is where the data, data is very, very important. If data is shared, then decisioning becomes easy. These days, data sharing is a very, very uh, important issue and uh, privacy and secrecy norms prohibit this. So RBI has come out with account aggregator model where data is shared by banks to other banks so that credit is properly done. And this is also called open banking. Many banks have started this uh, data aggregator model, account aggregator model like Bank of India is there, Axis Bank is there. And we also have uh, Razor, Razor Pay who share the data and bring, up, bring down the operational risk of wrong KYC. Subscription banking is uh, in the traditional banking, we had uh, the charging system of, which are separately for legal, which are separately for uh, processing and which are separately for uh, um, uh, what you call documentation, stamp duty and all. But subscription banking is you subscribe to a particular uh, bouquet of products and you get all of them for a single payment. And there is no better uh, example to give than Amazon Pay, Amazon Prime, which uh, does this in a very beautiful way. Finally, as I told you, collaboration with fintechs. There are almost 3,900 or fintechs. They don't have financial muscle, but they have uh, all good systems to take care of digital experience. So come over. But uh, the final say on this talk is we are not off the physical bank because there are different customers. Uh, old customer or a um, senior citizen would always like to one on, uh, like a one-on-one -on -one contact and an interaction, whereas a youngster would prefer uh, uh, digital experience. So branch banking will continue and we will get into something called digital banking, a combination of digital as well as physical given by banks, depending on the customer we choose. So NBFCs have to get ready for this kind of a model, learn the customer behavior, whether he's akin, whether he's uh, more prone to digital experience, or whether he wants uh, branches. So we have Mutut, we have some NBFCs who have branches where everything is done on, on site through branches. And there are uh, online banking platforms like uh, PSB loans in 59 seconds. And there are many such where it is through and through digital experience. Uh, that is from me. I'm sorry I took a bit of longer time and I hope I have uh, added a bit of uh, experience to this. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, it was really a pleasure to have you and share your experience and take us through the entire uh, risk management process. So I picked up a few things, uh, sir. One is that uh, one is the credit risk and the operational risk, which you said is the two important part of the retail banking. And one good thing that all of young people over here who are there should feel happy that uh, while we are talking about automation, I think human intervention is going to be there. And I think that's a good part of uh, being in the credit side, saying that some amount of human intervention is bound to be there for the credit decisioning process. I also found very interesting, sir, that the behavioral patterns you spoke about in retail, uh, you know, risk management and score-based and risk-based pricing. Uh, these are the two things which is going to make a big difference in the retail banking as time progresses. I also picked up, uh, you know, the regulatory norms you spoke about 
and uh, you have been very nice enough to actually differentiate the uh, the strength of uh, bank versus non banking finance companies and uh, very truthfully you said that uh, probably uh, collaboration is the future which i picked up very much in terms of co origination co lending uh, i think the future what you spoke about seems to be very interesting in terms of new banking subscription model and all those uh, uh, concept that's coming up i think it's a very interesting session that we had sir i really thank you for being here my my sincere apology to you as well as to all the uh, learners and my participants who are here on this platform to have uh, taken a little bit of delay because of the technical hitch uh, everything you try to do sometime it happens that the technical hitch comes in and we almost got delayed by 10 to 12 minutes and my sincere apology for on my behalf and on behalf of uh, the platform uh with this thank you sir and there are uh, if there are any questions uh, you can put it on the chat or you can unmute or and can speak and we'll try to see uh, we'll take around five questions and uh, take it forward if it's possible uh there is one question that has come up sir uh, where uh, there's gentleman is asking shivani uh, shivastav is asking i need to understand the five year relaxation in loan terms for women uh Uh, it's not exactly five year relaxation. It is five basis points lower interest for uh, women, which state bank gives. Uh, it's uh, it's called her loan, her loan, her home loan. Right. So it is it is celebrating womanhood. So right. and then uh, we have certain uh, products which are called three shakti package, where uh, there is concession given in uh, margin. Suppose the margin to be brought on. various elements of finance like uh, the margin to be brought in uh, uh, stakeholders margin instead of 30% we reduce it by 5% and the eligibility criteria you need to have 100 employees in your organization or enterprise to be funded and all so there are relaxations on every parameter so that we ensure women in business increase and they benefit out of financial inclusion uh, steps taken by us but five years increase in tenure is not there but case to case basis yes we can think of additional moratorium period and uh, if the repayment has to be tagged with the cash flows that is generally done so oh, thank you sir uh, uh, one need issue question is so did you mention that it's only given by sbi bank and not any other bank later no 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 almost now it is a trend even trend. NBF, N, nbfc nbfc this was started by sbi uh, about 8 years back where mm -hmm. and initially it was that if the first borrower in a joint borrower if the first borrower is lady then the housing loan housing loan carried a 5 bips 5 bips means uh, 5% means 5% I mean, not 5% 100 bips is 1% so mm -hmm. suppose the rate of interest general rate of interest is 0.55 A lady would get it at 8.50. Now most of the banks have picked up, and NBFC is <coughs> doing it. And further liberal uh, things which we have brought in is instead of first uh, borrower, it can be joint borrower. It can be first or second. And even the government started giving relaxation if it is a woman, a uh, person who is starting business or start taking a loan, the stamp duty for them was also less. It's reduced. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. Sir, thank you the, shivani thank you sir sir, uh, sir, I, sir sir is the future banking is a global phenomena or is a initiation for our country i think uh, let me tell you in uh, other countries i have the pleasure of being in two three countries i have seen across other countries banking has already advanced so much the branch where i used to sit in in uh, los angeles hardly had about four to five customers walking in because the rest used to do it online so the digital experience there had started way back when i was there in 2006 here it is starting a bit late but then yes the youngsters believe in digital experience so this would happen but there would be a combination because uh, let me give you some statistics in india almost 35 to 40 crore people are still not having banking so you have heard about jam it is jam trinity that is jandhan aadhar and mobility jandhan aadhar mobility jam trinity came into existence only 2014 so there people started getting into bank accounts so we are at a stage where we still need an hybrid model because as i told you 
almost uh, 30 crores or uh, to 45 crores don't have accounts in rural areas. And of the balance, let's say 80 to 85 crores who do have account, thanks to Chandan, they don't know online banking. Like in rural areas and semi-urban areas, they are not too adept to the new technology. So though they are on digital, they may not be able to do it. So what we are left out with is let us say 50 crores of people who are, or let's say 30 to 50 crores of people who are very good and want a more and more of digital experience. Then there is the in-between segment of 30 crores who are not very, maybe I, I can tell about myself, I'm not very keen on doing a mobile banking because I find risks. And there is rest 35 to 40 who still don't have a bank. So this hybrid model uh, has Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Satishan. Uh, I think uh, very true. Uh, you know what? Uh, thanks for asking that question. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel comfortable to ask. We have uh, one or two more questions we can pick up uh, before we can close the session. Uh, if you can highlight on prognosis, I uh, read somewhere the future of retail banking. Uh, as I told you, Retail banking is the thing to commence, the most important uh, banking segment which is going to come up. Let me tell you why retail banking is going to go up. Maybe it may take me two, three more minutes if that is okay. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah. The most important thing, the demography of India. People up to 35 years is large in number as compared to the other countries. So all these youngsters are more akin to uh, uh, online banking. So the future is if you can give best of interface, i.e. means in, uh, interface experience as well as digital experience if you give these people are going to onboard. Whereas in other banks, BRIC countries, the uh, digital thing is going up, but in our country, it is still not to the expected level. Secondly, the transition from the lower income to middle income group in India is growing. So, and our youngsters, if you see, I wouldn't have borrowed that easily, but my children will uh, easily borrow. So the propensity to borrow or the attitude towards borrowing has gone up. The young crowd has more disposable income. So they will borrow. They will not, they will not think twice before they spend. They will spend and earn. Our uh, generation was earn and then spend, but youngsters, they believe in improving their credit score by borrowing and credit score also improves when you borrow. Third thing, the interest rates have come down from what they were in the olden days. Financial uh, market has brought in a lot of fintechs who are vying for business. And the only way is to touch the big population. I think we, if you have read today's paper, we are the fifth largest economy in the world because UK has slipped, yeah, UK has slipped to six. So yes. there is a huge un unmet demand which will come only from retail. Corporate will get, because uh, the borders have opened up, there is uh, no border, it's a global village. So money will come for corporates from all different sides. But for an uh, um, individual, it has to be through retail market. Yeah, thank, you, thank you, Shivani. I think, uh, uh, well said, sir. I think uh, what you said is retail is going to the future because I think we have the population demography which is uh, uh, positive for India. I think the huge young population is going to make a big difference. Yeah, And banking still, we are still new to the banking. The huge amount of people are new to bank is going to come up. Um, so there is one question uh, from Samjit, uh, but uh, I think with a limited time, we need to think through whether we can take it up. Uh, Samjit is asking that, uh, can you tell me what are the 15 parameters of credit scoring? Uh, you know, uh, before uh, Hegde sir takes over, uh, Samjit, I think the credit parameters uh, for scoring, specifically, I don't think there are any specific ones which organization picks up. The large ones he spoke about uh, in those aspects, but I leave it to Mr. Hegde to take it up whether you want to, uh, you know, uh, whether there are any six, 15 parameters of specific ones that we, we have in mind. Uh, no, I have, uh, uh, let me tell you, 15 parameters when I said I spoke out of my experience, which was with SBI and then uh, with uh, Saraswat Bank, but each one develops his own uh, parameter metrics. 
because yeah. it comes out of the data analytics yeah data analytics when i say state bank has almost 45 to 50 crores accounts on their books so they have a huge customer base which they can lend this is called upselling so while doing upselling what they do before sending out a communication they do a credit scoring model as i told you credits in the account the debits in the account the number of accounts they have the past account which they have taken and closed whether they have uh, multiple saving bank accounts of other with other banks all these 15 are taken from the answers given in the loan um, saving bank account application or uh, from the loan application they will ask what is your income in bracket they will ask from so and so do you own a car do you have an existing house or a rented house do you have a credit card so all these parameters which are information which we have taken in the application are graded and a score is uh, built out of this 15 parameters into 100. So exhibit score also is one more uh, parameter out of it where we give 10 marks. And married, unmarried, that again is a score. Huh? That is again. So there are different, uh, what you call, uh, flavors to a person's uh, lifestyle. So all those things are taken into consideration. And each bank has its own model. As I told you, it can be 15, it can be 50. If your NPA percentage goes up, let's say uh, 15%, 20%, then you have to give a rethink whether your credit score is good. And if your uh, NPA percentage comes down below 0.2%, uh, that means your credit score is, uh, model is very good. Like State Bank had a um, NPA percentage of below 0.5%. Some NBFCs and some uh, uh, MFIs have an NPA percentage of just 0.2%. So whatever model you are adopting is good. And you do an analytics of uh, the bad loans and find out what went wrong and add that as a parameter. Yeah, absolutely, sir. Thank you. Samjit, I think uh, sir has picked up very well and summed up. Uh, there cannot be one single, uh, you know, set of uh, parameters. Uh, the parameters has to come from the portfolio. And that's where, uh, you know, in based on your customer segments that you are looking at it and the product that you're looking at it, that decides the entire uh, process of scoring. Um, thank you, Samjit, for uh, uh, you know asking that question. It was very, very useful. Um, I think uh, we are almost at 12.45, sir. I think uh, we have taken a, a bunch of your time and it was very nice of all of you who are here uh, till the end of the session. Uh, I really would like to thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Hegde, sir, for uh, being with us and sharing your perspective on the retail risk management. And we would like to have more of you on our platform so that all the uh, colleagues of mine in the industry as well as on the platform, they can benefit. And we'll continue this discussion as we go ahead. Uh, with this, uh, I'd like to uh, conclude the session and I'd like to thank each one of you for being part of this and uh, look forward to our mails that is going to come up and we are going to share more uh, the calendar in terms of what are the other webinars we organized. Plus, also, we are also very uh, uh, interested in getting in touch with your organization in terms of seeing how to give productive manpower, uh, you know, new manpower resources from the colleges, fresh graduates, we, you know, certify them and provide to the organization. That's one area that we're looking at it. The other is that we are looking at the digital learning, which we are very strong on, on the mortgage side, as well as the retail asset side. So uh, you can always come to our website, check it out, the, uh, you know, the modules that we have. And uh, we have a huge amount of, uh, you know, modules coming up, new certification programs are coming up. Plus, we do also classroom training programs. And with all, with all that, uh, I once again like to thank you and say namaste and jai hind.